My name is Zina Mazda. I'm an internal communications officer here at the UN Human Rights Office, and I'm very happy to be your host for today's event. We have a really great lineup for you today. We will start with um, a conversation with the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Olga Turk, on his vision for the potential of UN 2.0 for human rights. Then we have um, a short video to show you on UN 2.0 in action for human rights. And then we will have um, a panel discussion with some of our senior leaders to deep a little bit, dive a little bit deeper into some of these issues. Hi, Commissioner. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. Great to like to be able to join you, yes. I would like to start with a recent milestone for human rights. Um, a few months ago, we commemorated the 75th anniversary of the <laughs> Universal Declaration of Human Rights with the high level event, among other things. So what were your takeaways from that initiative, um, particularly perhaps on the need for change? Look, we are obviously in very troubled times when it comes to the state of the world, when it comes to conflict, when it comes to restrictions to civic space, when it comes to inequalities and, and poverty eradication, not least also as a result of, of the COVID pandemic. And it was a very important moment to actually use the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a, if you like, a, a a board from which, a platform from which to actually change and reframe the narrative about human rights and also to make sure that states and societies are not only committed to the latter but also are committed to the implementation of the human rights norms and the normative framework that has been established over the last what, 75 years or so. And so it was a very important moment for us to re dynamize the human rights movement, especially against the backdrop of, of the turbulence that we see with the many wars, uh, with what's happening in many countries around the world. And I was, it was a minor miracle, frankly, that in December, when we hosted this high level event, where we had, uh, you know, all regions very well represented, head of government, head of state level, where civil society was, which was really a multi-stakeholder event, where we were able to actually get some 800 pledges, um, mostly from member states, about 154 member states made pledges and sometimes very concrete pledges to change things, to transform things. And, but also from the private sector, from civil society organizations, from other parts of the UN to actually say, okay, we are committing ourselves again and we want to advance and we want to use human rights narratives, we want to use the normative framework that has been established to actually do things that make the world a better place. And also to look into the future and not just to look at what happened in the past, but also to really see, OK, what does human rights mean for the digital transformation? What does it mean when it comes to the big issues of our time, climate change, triple planetary crisis and so forth? So I think there was an inbuilt change motivation in this whole exercise of using the past to identify what the present challenges are, but also looking towards the future. And so it was it was a great moment for us, despite the doom and gloom that we all go through on a daily basis. The world is changing and, and we do need to change with it. Um, and if we talk a bit more concretely about what that means, what does UN 2.0 mean for human rights globally? So, you know, when I started my position as High Commissioner in October 22, I've just come from New York, where indeed for the UN at large, it was very important to look to the future, to see what, what are the changes that are taking place in the external environment and how do we as the UN adapt to it? We are a huge, let's not forget, we are a huge bureaucracy. We, you know, bureaucracies have an in their innate inertia when it comes to change, because bureaucracies are there to, to be, uh, if you like, a, a, a place of stability in, in some respects. But we see a rapidly changing world around us. So when UN 2.0 was included in the Common Agenda Report of the Secretary General, it was obvious to me 
that UN 2.0 directly relates to each and every aspect of our work. So if, if you go through it, innovation, we have to innovate the way we work. We need to look at the tools that we have at our disposal uh, in the human rights area. And we need to see and question ourselves and flip the orthodoxies on, on a number of them and say, okay, is this the way to go? Is, isn't there, aren't there better ways of doing things? Aren't there alternative ways of doing things because of the challenges that we face? The same on data. We sit in the human rights world on an enormous amount of data sets. And we have them both from the mechanisms, the special procedures, from the treaty bodies, but also from from, of course, the Human Rights Council, but then also in the field, we, we have an enormous amount of data and we need to make that data available. We, we need to make sure that we present this data, we analyze this data and we tell a compelling story of this data because this makes also human rights, brings it to life. Then we have behavioral science. I mean, human rights is about behavior. It's about conduct of member states. It's conduct of people. So it's obvious there's a direct link between what we are trying to influence in the outside world and how we are trying to influence it and what type of behavioral insight we can use to adapt and to change. And again, very important for us. Then this issue of strategic foresight. Strategic foresight means for us to constantly ask ourselves what type of, if we look to the future, what is going, what may happen, uh, you know, this future visioning and what needs to be done now in order for the dystopian future not to become a possible reality? And that's a, it's a different tactic. And we see it, I was just in DRC last, last week. Um, the MONUSCO, as you know, is, 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 is in a disengagement phase. It's so important, also very concretely, for the colleagues on the ground to envisit, envision the future, to think about it, and then to adapt in their own planning. And that really has to start now. Um, and then we have the whole issue of, of uh, you know, the whole issue of, of how we deal with, with impact analysis. I mean, how can we prove better what it is that we are trying to achieve and, and how can we actually show the impact that we have directly on the lives of people out there? And so it all comes together very nicely for us. Of course, it has to be adapted to the specifics of the organization, to the specifics of the human rights side of things. But yeah, UN 2.0 for, for, for human rights, and not just for my office, but also for human rights writ large in the UN system is incredibly important as a result. And yeah, sorry, and I forgot digital transformation. Digital transformation, of course, is also part of it, yeah. Uh, you gave many examples uh, there already, and so guided by the UN 2.0, what's next for the Human Rights Office? So we have embarked on a change initiative of our own. Uh, we did uh, a lot of consultations, we had staff surveys done, and we really did a 360 degree assessment of, of where we are as an office. Um, we have had change initiatives in the past, but if I again compare it with, with other parts of the UN system, where if you like continuous change is part of the method of work, I think OHHR, because of the difficulties of, of the human rights mandate that we sometimes face, because of also the budgetary issues with the R, with the regular budget and the XB, and not really in a, in, we are not, we, we didn't really frankly get the resources that we need for the for our mandate to be able to implement. I think it was important to really have a very clear and honest look at ourselves, both when it comes to organizational culture, when it comes to working methods, when it comes to processes, when it comes to structure, when it comes to our relationship with field offices, with the rest of the with this UN system as a whole. And so we did this 360 degree review of who we are, what we want to be, and we also included it with our management plan for the future, which meant that we we did look at the external environment and how can we position ourselves much better for for the purposes of of an organization that is fit for the future. And so we really took the UN 2.0 
as an example, as a as a vehicle of change for the organization as a whole, and we're in the midst of of going through this process as we speak. Hi, Commissioner. Thanks uh, very much for joining us today. If I could have uh, one final um, thought from you, how would you encourage everyone to get involved? Well, I mean, because it's also for the UN system at large, we are really confronted with a time where the principles and the values and the and the even the, the basics of international law, including international humanitarian law, international human rights law, are often being questioned in ways that are not informed at all by what they have brought us, but also how they actually respond to our current and the challenges of the future. So it is so important that we see human rights as part of our basic DNA, not just within my office, but for the UN at large, that we embrace it, that we know what, where to get the expertise from, and, and that we work towards the full recommitment and the redynamizing of, of human rights in particularly in these very troubled times so that we, we are able to, 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 to deliver better as the United Nations. And I think this goes to both um, issues of networking, it, issues of embracing change, issues of, of, of also questioning ourselves whether we are doing the right thing at the moment or whether there aren't better ways of doing it. And, and this is not just the office of, 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 I mean, my office, if you like, it really cuts across the whole UN system. And, and yes, I hope that with, with this attitude, with, 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 with also UN 2.0, we can, we can deliver much better to, to the people that we serve. Thank you very much, High Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. And all the best. Bye bye. So as you have just heard, uh, a lot of uh, exciting opportunities uh, coming up uh, here at Green Human Rights. Um, but we also need your ideas and your energy to move this forward. Uh, we'd encourage you to join our network. We're uh, putting a link up in the chat. So you can click on that and sign up to stay uh, up to date on developments and, and get involved in, in the conversation as well. So the High Commissioner talked about how you and know and what it means for human rights globally. So we want to take a moment now and show you a short video uh, on a little bit more specific on how data and foresight is helping drive the impact of human rights forward. Take a look at this. I think the emergency response teams very squarely fit exactly this gap and help communicate better what we mean and transmit this information in a way that is understood by the rest of the UN. For example, the UNCTs, the resident coordinators, but also at the global level more the other UN agencies. A lot of what we do is about ensuring the UN is aware of the most pressing human rights uh, concerns uh, and particularly those they may tr trigger a deterioration in the country's situation. Um, by focusing on, on, on summarizing, visualizing human rights risks and trends uh, for decision makers. The emergency response teams provides a step in our digital transformation. It combines a human rights expert with a data professional. We cannot rely only and solely with the, with the old human rights skills, but we need to bring in something which is of this century, and that is specialists in information management, people who can translate messages into communication, people who can allow us to access the wider uh, pool of uh, data and information and sources that are out there now uh, more in a digital form as compared to the old way of doing work. For me, the most exciting part about the emergency response team program is this integration of information management professionals. People who understand 
and can leverage data that can then help the substantive expert, the human rights officers, bring their analysis to the greater community in a way that they can use the information. The emergency response teams uh, were born out of the human rights upfront commitments and how they have developed through time um, and the prevention platforms, the, the humanitarian development nexus, the call to action, the data strategy. And the teams have uh, not just been able to adapt to these changes, but actually being very proactive and dynamic, uh, transform them into, into something concrete that the office was able to use and leverage. It is not magic. It is simply that puts the UN before the um, very clear cases of why you cannot ignore certain realities on the ground. Because sustainability of whether it is development, whether it is a peace process, whether it is a humanitarian response, needs to, to be based on responding to the, to the situation on the ground. I'm joined now by our panel members, and we're going to have a bit more of a, a deep dive discussion on current UN Togono initiatives and upcoming opportunities here at UN Human Rights. So I'm pleased to welcome uh, three of our senior directors. We have Christian Salazar, who is the Director of Field Operations. Peggy Hicks is Director of our Thematic Engagement Special Procedures and Rights Development Division. And Ibrahim Salama is our Chief of Human Rights Treaties Branch. Thank you for joining us today. We'd also like to hear from you, though. So please uh, use the chat. It's open. Um, you can send in your questions. And towards the end, we'll select a few questions and ask for our panel members. So, Christian, let me begin with you. Um, the High Commissioner spoke about his vision of, for strengthening OHCHR's regional and uh, country offices. And we saw in the video um, examples of how data and foresight can drive insights for human rights risks and trends. So based on your experience as director of field operations, how, where have you been seeing the impact of the UN on the work? Hi, everybody. Um, the impact is pretty comprehensive, actually. It really improves our work across the board. Um, we are present in around 90 countries worldwide. Our field uh, presences, they do monitoring and reporting, uh, advocacy for human rights, technical assistance, um, and I would just zoom into continuing with, with the conversation of the importance of data and, and innovations in data. Um, you know, I'll work in uh, monitoring human rights and producing reports and recommendations is one of the work that, that we do. Um, and this is not a case-based work. That means we uh, we we monitor our cases of human rights violations and put them together, then analyze them and provide recommendations. And more and more, we combine this case-based work with a larger data analysis, trend analysis, uh, to put the, uh, a broader kind of um, frame to how we look at human rights. That helps us first to broaden the evidence base uh, for for the analysis, but also uh, a deeper root cause analysis, and then larger data sets combined with uh, the rigorous case uh, case work um, allows us also for longer term strategies. That's important because many human rights um, uh, problems are deeply entrenched. They need longer term political will, longer term programs, longer term investment to make a change, and, and so this combination of the case based work and, and the larger data and the summing, I think, is, is, is an important part of the 2.0 when it comes to our impact on the ground. And let me add uh, just a few words on the regional dimension of all of this. More and more human rights problems are not just uh, related to one country. Uh, the impact of climate change, the situation of refugees and migrants, the human rights impact of transnational crime, for example, you name a few. So this, will, this requires really much more regional and some regional analysis beyond one country and recommendations to countries uh, how to address them. I have one example here out of Latin America in the Caribbean. Uh, this is a joint work going on from last year and this year. Uh, different agencies, us on human rights, UNDP on the development side, OCHA on the humanitarian side, DPPA on the political uh, department on the political side, and all of this together with the Development Cooperation Office and the Human Rights Advisors, the 
peace development advisors, the OCHA advisors, team leaders, and economists on the ground, the the resident community leaders, all of those put together an analysis of um, these different data streams from the different so-called pillars of the UN. And I think um, that really the human rights problems have been so, become so complex that we need really to integrate much more the different uh, data work of different parts of the UN. This cross-pillar work, I think, is the future. We have to bring the silos of just looking at problems from one perspective and bring it all together. And I think the 2.0 work on innovation and data and analytics will kind of push us all to do more of this joint analysis for action, of course, and then also hopefully for joint action and improvement of this. Thank you. Let me uh, turn to you um, and zoom out a little bit onto the global thematic issues that your division works on. Um, what, how do you think the UN 2.0 is enabling us to navigate the complexities of human rights in a digital age? Hey, thanks, Lena, and happy to with, um, be with you all as well. UN 2.0 is at heart about fostering ingenuity in the service of humanity. And we're trying to do that both within UN human rights, but also for all the communities we serve. We live in an age in which there is so much happening in the digital and data world. And we, we see enormous opportunities for, for using that, for tapping that to be a better world with regards to human rights. But at the same time, of course, it all comes with risk for human rights as well. So we really see that there's a, a really pressing need for our office to put to go to work really to address both sides of that equation. How can we best leverage, use, and apply digital technology for human rights and manage the risk at the same time? Um, we see so much potential in the UN quintet of change. Uh, our hardest problem is really prioritizing where we start to implement some of this within our work. But let me highlight sort of three examples of, of creative projects that we're pretty proud of um, as, as some of the steps in that direction. Uh, the High Commissioner spoke about behavioral science, and it's an area that I think is, it, we, we need to figure out how to leverage it across human rights work globally, not just UN human rights, but all of us that care about advancing human rights. Um, we looked at one of the issues that I think may be one of the most challenging ones we face um, from a human rights perspective, and that's the question of migration, and in particular, the use of disinformation and negative narratives around migration to really create a, a toxic environment that doesn't allow us to make good policy decisions or good decisions uh, for people. And what we've dis, uh, discovered uh, in two pilot countries, Malaysia and Australia, is that we looked at them to figure out you know, what values do people share? How can we talk about these issues in a way that will get beyond some of that? Uh, not surprisingly, we found that one of the things people like to talk about and agree on is food. Um, and so we ended up doing a series of videos that bring together people from different communities over the process of preparing a meal together to talk about some of these issues. And I think it's been really compelling and we've learned a lot from doing it. We're going to have practical guidance about how to take some of those lessons and bring them elsewhere. The next um, project I wanted to highlight quickly uh, relates to how we can use data to leverage for the SDGs. Um, what we found is that we can do more to bring partners together at a national level in this regard. We have national statistical offices who are doing incredible work supporting the SDG indicators, and we have national human rights institutions that really understand what's happening about human rights on the ground. But what we found in a lot of contexts is that those two institutions didn't have much collaboration or partnership together. So we've worked in more than 14 countries now to create partnerships between national statistical offices and national human rights institutions. And now they're working together to use and learn from each other and do better on both ends of that spectrum. And for example, we saw last year alone a 37% increase in the number of national statistical offices that are providing evidence now and data on the prevalence of discrimination. So they're looking at human rights issues potentially in a different way through this partnership. And finally, I wanted to comment quickly on how we're starting to use and using AI and open source information to better understand what's happening in our world and therefore to be able to do our job on human rights better. We've developed AI-based tools that allow us to really gather a lot more information. Now, the challenge there, of course, is that that's not for the information and you can't just jump right in uh, to working on it, but it gives us a better sense of what's happening globally, the trends um, and hotspots analysis that it gives us 
gives us a starting point to do our work better at other places. And we're really looking at how we can expand that sort of work to looking at things like protests and internet shutdowns. And we started to bring those uh, pieces in and want to do more of that in the future. Ibrahim, your division provides uh, substantive and technical support to the Human Rights Council and the treaty mechanisms. And you've already seen um, the importance and challenges of digital transformation. How have you seen a strengthening of the human rights system through digital transformation and the other UN 2.0 components? It's amazing to state that it was the COVID crisis that was eye-opener for all of us to see how much and what we were really missing. In fact, there are two fundamental notions in human rights, which is the notion of in the very first sentence of the charter, we the peoples, and the notion of meaningful participation. And these two gain a lot if technology assumes its role in the defense of human rights. There are many interesting reasons why this has not been the case and why did we have to wait for COVID to realize this and act on it. But this is not the issue now. The issue now is to say that uh, technology can help giving life to norms because while human rights are universal, the challenges of their enforcement is very are very local by definition. And that's why the mechanisms in particular uh, have the feature of not really having their own fact-finding tool. Of course, we rely on our field presence, uh, as Christian just said, as one of the main input and other UN agencies, but uh, special rapporteurs and treaty body experts need to have this direct access. And the uh, um, the more they are nearer to the, 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 the local realities, the more they can tailor. The, you cannot tailor solutions of human rights situations improvement without contextualizing uh, where they happen. And this technology can offer. And we saw a lot of, uh, paradoxically enough, under COVID, we saw a lot of engagement to a new grassroots uh, population of uh, new actors of human rights who are not the frequent flyers, who are not the usual suspects. And these were really very real people. Uh, and young women, men and women, uh, whose interaction with the human rights mechanisms uh, uh, was absolutely eye-opener. And I think that even the future of our capacity as United Nations and human, as human rights architecture to better serve human rights depends on how more we can get use of this. Of course, there are obstacles, but I leave those to another discussion. Let me take the example of petition, individual, com individual uh, complaints by individuals in countries where the, who have ratified optional protocols. This is the nearest point where the human rights norms uh, get uh, into the lives of uh, uh, individuals. And it's shameful but honest to admit that we were only working on the basis of very archaic ways before that technology. This technology allowed us to establish a, a digital platform where individuals can immediately engage and, and put their complaints and where they can see the development of their complaints. Uh, also, we, uh, because of the proliferation of mechanisms at times, it was very essential to allow states to work more efficiently through a data tracking of recommendations. All of these are concrete examples where efficiency have improved a lot simply thanks to technology. But we need to get out of the comfort zones and we need to invest in technology. So there's so much on the horizon for us right now. Um, as the High Commissioner uh, announced, we're, we're really looking to do a broader uh, service center, uh, a new hub that will allow us to really pull together some of this work and really enhance it going forward. Um, we're also going to continue to build our partnerships in this area. So hoping many of you online will come to us with ideas on that front. Um, we're working within the context of the uh, interagency processes right now to develop something that will be have an impact across the UN system. This is the SG uh, mandated and, and now launched effort to have a human rights due diligence guidance for digital technology use within the system. So this is something we hope will help all of us to do better work in terms of how we're using digital technology, but also we hope it can be a model of good practice that's available to our partners and, and governments and others outside. Um, we're working, of course, within the context of the Global Digital Compact and looking for how that can serve some of the work that we're talking about. And one of the ideas in there is a proposal for a digital human rights advisory service that we hope we can take forward in this context. And then I also wanted to say a bit about generative AI. Obviously, it's been the hot topic in this field in the last year, and we're really looking for, for how we can 
deal with both sides of the equation here as well in terms of opportunities and challenges. We've already developed uh, something we call the Rights View AI Assistant, which is a, a Gen AI uh, large language model using human rights data, 20,000 documents, pulling them together and figuring out how we can use that tool to predict and do better work in the area of human rights. Um, but we're also looking at uh, predictive projects around early warning. Uh, we're working with economist impact around early warning predictive tools that bring together human rights indicators with early warning analysis to allow us potentially to be able to do a better job of serving human rights globally, our UN partners and governments who want to know more about what's happening on the ground in an early warning and preventive way. And finally, um, we're looking at how we can address the company side, the other side of the equation on Gen AI. We have a project called BTEC that has focused on how can companies do better in living up to their responsibilities around human rights under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And so last year we launched a project around generative AI in that area, looking at what are some of the the big human rights risks that they face and what is expected of those companies in addressing those challenges. And we've developed a, a, a number of papers, one of which that looks at what are their current safety practices, and then also a, a recommendations paper looking at what we think needs to be happening in that space. And we'll continue working through a, a community of practice that brings together the largest uh, tech companies around how we impl uh, implement and operationalize some of those ideas on generative AI as well. And uh, Christian, from the country and uh, regional perspective, where do you think the priorities are for human rights informed by you think? But I think there's so many things, it's really hard to say. So to be very, very selective first, certainly in protection, civic space is shrinking across the globe. Human rights defenders are under threat, are being killed. So we would need to be also more data savvy and uh, capturing and killing the arbitrary and human rights defenders to act quicker. Um, uh, strategic force like the AM and science in our advocacy against repressive laws against civil society. This is certainly one of the areas where we'll have to do more on prevention. Um, and I think uh, we will make bigger efforts together with many other uh, partners in the UN and beyond, strengthen the capacity of national actors. There's nothing like, you know, a strong national human rights institution uh, to act. Um, and we hope that the whole region of change, so to speak, we can transfer some knowledge we're gaining to the national partners because ultimately change needs to be driven by national partners. In the promotion of human rights, we want to upgrade our human rights education. We are clearly uh, um, foresight, strategic foresight and behavioral science will be very important. Um, to look at the motivations of people that incentives to abandon uh, harmful uh, practices and, and, and foster um, uh, pro-human rights behavior. And then finally, accountability. I think the new science and data, the new ways of evidence collection, all of this, I think we need to do better and more and also to inform national and international courts to hold perpetrators accountable. So the fight against the killing and the strengthening of accountability worldwide is as a priority uh, uh, for the coming years. All right, so we have uh, some questions from the chat that we are going to uh, ask our panelists. Uh, from Sandra, um, is there perhaps a place, perhaps online, where new human rights defenders can start learning the basics, exchanging and supporting others? Um, Peggy. Yeah, I, to be honest, I think that's one of the areas, Sandra, where, where we need to do more. Uh, one of the things in this Digital Human Rights Advisory Service we want to do is make it easier for people to try to get access to the information. Uh, Ibrahim talked about the wealth of, of recommendations, good practices, you know, uh, country analysis that's out there. But there isn't as much of a, a consolidated hub for some of that as we might like. And now we, we have the tools. They do exist, of course, to be able to make it so you don't have to read every single report. You can ask more, you know, what are what's the debate here? What are the big issues? How can we get at it? So we want to uh, to really use digital technology to develop how our information is available to all of you for now. Um, there is, uh, we've, we've developed sort of a prototype which just pulls together some of the key human rights uh, related digital documents. And it's a uh, UN.digital hub 
uh, and it's uh, available, pulls together the key reports by both our office and the mechanisms and other places on it. But we hope to be able to improve it soon and, and hope to come back to hear your comments on how we do on that. All right, so we have another question from uh, Christoph. Could you elaborate on how the use of human rights data uh, can be used by the UN to prevent conflicts? Maybe, Christian, you both touched on this. Um, uh, Christian, you have any thoughts on that? Um, there, I think there is, a, for example, a UN Crisis Coordination Center in, in New York that pulls together the data uh, from across the system, including us. We're the most important providers to it, but but everybody. And and then the uh, the, uh, the different decision makers in the UN look at country situations based on this evidence. And then that is really the basis to take decisions on, for example, uh, on which laws or which policies or which specific issues the UN needs to address, whether through uh, some cooperation programs, whether through wide uh, or public diplomacy or some statements. And, and it is, I think, this evidence base that makes us uh, stronger in our advocacy in our way to influence those who you know, can make a change in human rights. All right, so let's see um, we have some more questions coming in. Can I add one comment, Lenny, while you're yeah, for the next course. one? I should have also mentioned for Sandra the Universal Human Rights Index, which is something yeah. see, <laughs> Avery Meme has a note on it. Do you want to say something you think about it? Precisely. I fully agree with you, Peggy, that we are still far from the consolidated hub as it should be. But the nearest point, if I may say, it's the Human Rights Index. And I think that's why uh, within the capacity building team uh, uh, with the treaty division, we are trying to improve it more and more because you can go by theme, you can go by country. We're still not linking it optimally enough to other sources of information in the office. But it's linked to the SDGs specifically yes. as well. And, and again, it was uh, we used AI and machine learning along with the Danish Institute for Human Rights, I think, to, they did to help us develop project, that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Can I say something? Also, we're having that conversation. Um, an important entry point, for, for entry point for data and change on human rights is the Agenda 2030 in the SDGs. And just to give an example, SDG 16, there are a number of indicators to measure improvement or deterioration um, that are important and have agreed, been agreed on by member states. Uh, conflict related deaths, killings, and other deaths against human rights against journalists trade unionist, independent human rights institution and prevalence of discrimination and harassment. And the problem is that on the social economic side, data on health, on, you know, on education, we have usually larger data collection across the board. But on issues like those, less. So one big challenge will be, and I think you mentioned to that, uh, to come up really with these global standards to measure these type of indicators on the SDG 16, and then to anchor it into the national uh, statistical offices. So they are collected, but that also the data in the different countries can be compared because that drives decisions at the national and also at the regional international level. We often get the question um, about behavioral science and bringing the best of psychology, economics, and social sciences together. So a question to all, um, what are your initial ideas? I would say going beyond the law. The law is not enough. And this can only happen when we translate in a much more accessible manner the essence of the values. And, and in this respect, let me take uh, the example of hate speech. You cannot achieve the SDG 16 of inclusive societies without involving everybody, not only in denouncing, which is easier part of the story, hate speech, but in providing a remedial speech. We're living a fantastic era where every human being is a media producer, but also a potential abuser of this huge capacity. And that's why Peggy was right that the standards of due diligence on, 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 the, on the digital uh, sphere, on the virtual sphere is very important and still missing. And, and, and Peggy is part of the, of the offices working hard on this. But that's why, for example, on hate speech, beyond the law, we are trying to uh, as we say in French, uh, vulgarize, simplify, or make much more accessible to the general public. What are the criteria of hate speech? And we're collaborating even with the media, uh, uh, with with the, with the meta uh, um, uh, appellate body and standards. We are putting standards, for example, on the Rabat to counter hate speech by remedial speech on the website. So unless we get this new partnerships with the real influencers, the millions of people who deal with uh, Facebook every day, a fraction of them only think about human rights. 
So they're immediately engaged in activities and behavior and speech that impact on human rights without knowing the basics. So unless we leave our legalistic ivory towers and go into the really layer jargon, especially the, the, the youth, we will not be there. So we are moving on that. And one of the things that we do, we have to focus so much on is that human rights is a project that brings in all different communities. It's, it's for too long, as, as Ibrahim said, been, you know, a lot of people focus on the legal side of it, which is important. I'm a lawyer, you know, I have to say that. But the reality is in the digital tech side, we're looking so much at technologists and data scientists and people who have skills and, and, and abilities that are essential to protection of human rights globally, but they speak a different language than we speak. And part of what we're trying to look at is how we build bridges between these different communities. And you can say the same thing with the behavioral science side, really looking at the health and uh, community, behavioral scientists, academic communities. How do we make sure that we don't allow sort of the, the different silos or spheres in which we speak to interfere with what are really common projects? We just talk about them in different ways. So really building those bridges is a crucial part of what we'd like to do. Um, yeah, human rights is mostly about political will. And I do think that I uh, have a much clearer understanding and in the analysis to say what drives political will and decisions, what kind of motivations and incentives are there, you know, is important for our own advocacy to do it. We do it kind of, but uh, as of experience, but to do it more systematically, I think it's really important uh, to nurture this in where we put emphasis on our quiet or public diplomacy. And then there's also many, many human rights problems that have to do with culture, with practices of people. Uh, for example, the, 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 the issues of the LGBTQI rights and the repression and the aggression and the homophobia. All of these things are not just politicians, maybe with the, 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 they use this or misuse this situation, but often it's entrenched in culture. And so behavior science to think about what drives people's values and behaviors and address this uh, through the different means, I think is another very important element of, of the work now, but also for the future. And we have a, a question building on that uh, precise point on uh, how behavioral science uh, can be used at the country level to develop laws and policies that bring about positive human rights uh, impact. Now, I think Christian's hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's exactly what we're looking at. And, and Ibrahim also referred to how we have to localize human rights work the, the, the standards are global, but the work is local. Um, and that means you have to understand what are, if, if something, um, if, if a human right isn't being implemented, there are a lot of different reasons why that can be. But in many instances, there are different issues as Christian said, it's, it's because of resistance that uh, needs to, that is deep seated for a variety of reasons and figuring out how to overcome that. You can't just you know say, no, this is the right thing to do, or this is what the standard is. Um, we have to really look at what are the elements, what are the ways to convince people to change. Um, I spoke earlier about migration. You know, one of the things that that uh, we've seen is that people who actually meet and work with migrants are more likely to support migration. Um, and it's it's actually people who are the the furthest away from some of those issues that have the strongest health beliefs on it. So that's the type of learning that behavioral science can help us with uh, to figure out how we can convey our messages better in a way that resonates with people, addresses what their concerns are, and helps us to work together towards better human rights outcomes. I mean, we have good examples. Uh, female genital mutilation is a very good one over the past years. Uh, this practice, you know, where all we're looking at, you know, who would influence this, these practices? And work with religious leaders, for example, influence others, work with teachers, work with health workers, and then what kind of support do they need from national level? How should law enforcement, how should legal reform be driven? How can the international norms and standards nurture this whole kind of effort? And, you know, it has had uh, impact. It cannot be taken for granted. Nothing can be taken for granted. But this is a concrete example where we have seen a behavioral science impacting in the different levels of change that are needed to for, for a sustainable, uh, say, change of, of social practice. I think two words have been pronounced now, culture and religion. And this is a very good example of the challenge for the human rights community to get out of the of the legalistic comfort zone. Uh, and, and we have seen uh, 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 a very transformative 
powerfully transformative uh, potential uh, when we insert culture. The problem is that the classical view of culture and religion in human rights law is rather conservative. Please read article uh, paragraph five of the famous Vienna Declaration Program of Action, the mantra of human rights. It says cultural and religious particularities should be respected, but they cannot be used to violate human rights. So in a way, it's, that it's admitting that there is a dilemma, but not projecting what's the way out. And I believe in our experience, both on hate speech and on the engagement of faith actors, that one of the ways out is to, is to use culture uh, and art more and more. So the more we do this, A, we speak to the to the uh, young generations, B, we benefit from technology, C, we involve what I call the non-traditional, non-human rights, real human rights and cultures and actors. Uh, CEDO, for example, is interested recently in this. They created a project of CEDO Knowledge Hub where they address three influencers uh, of the young generation, uh, young women and men uh, in education, in the religious institutions uh, and in the media. And this is completely a new category. It's people who, who do not deal with human rights as such, but who are at the heart of human rights. And they try to unpack the tensions and complementarities with respect to gender equality between different faith traditions and human rights. It was an eye opener recently, a meeting in Rabat, where we have seen how much there is uh, in terms of convergence that should be uh, enough to sideline or to neutralize the tensions. Just as I get data to address the backwards slide in human rights and then see the link, please, my missions from uh, BTEC and the digital, uh, the flip side of, uh, of uh, digital technologies. Yeah, no, the, the data issues are, are central. We, we have uh, a very extensive analysis of how we can better leverage data for human rights. Um, part of what we're doing internally is pulling together our work and, and, and looking at how we can. Uh, come together, prioritize within the work. Christian pointed to the important work that's being done around civic space, challenges to human rights defenders, um, really trying to figure out um, what already exists. This is part of the UN's data strategy overall, trying to turn us into um, a more effective data organization um, and, and figuring out how that can allow us to both, as I said, look at how we can work more efficiently and better but also, we all know that you know data drives decision making as well, and it's hard to use human rights data sometimes because it's not as easily accessible. Um, we talk about this that there is a lot more data available on things like economic and social issues a lot of times than there is on more sensitive civil and political issues. The number of people in detention uh, globally, arbitrarily, is not an easy statistic to get. Um, but the more we can figure out ways to, to access that information and use it, um, the better. We focus a lot as well on disaggregated data. Um, so many human rights problems are buried under data sets that don't look at who's within them. Um, and so, for example, people of African descent and law enforcement attacks um, and racial discrimination is often obscured by data sets that don't recognize you know, and don't give us the data we need about disproportional uh, abuse against certain groups. Well, um, building on that, uh, from Tia, we have a question on how the UN, um, how does the UN approach ethical standards for AI, especially for achieving gender equality and the, and the SDGs? I'm kind of the 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 a the, the ethical AI. standards of AI. We've worked a lot. Um, UNESCO, of course, has um, a, a groundbreaking document on ethical recommendations on AI, which we've engaged with, supported, uh, contributed to on the human rights side. It's a very human rights uh, centered document, uh, and it's to us that's a, a critical piece of what needs to be done around AI. Of course, ethics only takes us so far. That's why we support the human rights framework because it is the grounding upon which. We turn ethics into something that's global. It's not based on, you know, my uh, my ethical or values approach it could be different from one place to another. Um, and of course, it's legally uh, obligatory. You know, states all over the world have agreed that these are the standards that they will apply. So that's what we're trying to bring into the conversation around artificial intelligence. And for women um, and gender, this is a critical issue because we know that. Uh, the digital divide more uh, disproportionately affects women, and women are are on the sharp end 
of the abuse of digital technology in many instances as well, including, uh, for example, the amount of online attacks and, and, and uh, negative speech directed towards them and violent speech directed towards them is much worse. So we really need to look at how we do this better. In the same vein, I would say that artificial intelligence is also uh, an eye opener on the on the gray zones of human rights. It should humble us and remind us that human rights universality is not a done deal. It's a permanent work in progress, and that's why all these emerging challenges require discussion in an interdisciplinary uh, uh, manner. And, and this is actually what is happening. Human rights universality was not born in 1948, and, and it will never be uh, 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 completely achieved till the end of times. It's a permanent challenge. If we could go on and on and on and on. Uh just want to highlight how this latest aspect of uh, hate speech, for example, we have the super election here now, that we can see that uh, the misogynist hate speech, particularly addressed against uh, female candidates, measurable, you can see this is growing, and, and that's, for example, one phenomenon, talk about ethical standards, also um, concrete measures to be taken uh, by states uh, for better protection, a better control of hate speech, and, uh, is, is really something very important for human rights, and I think it is, will continue to grow. These impacts of hate speech on different areas of human rights, uh, uh, fake news, etc., all of that is is really an important part of today's life, and, and we need to tackle it uh, if we want to grow the human My last word would be that our best chance is maybe to develop local initiatives inspired from universal values. Without this, there is no way to cope from outside and achieve the change desired. I did want to add in on the, the digital divide point as well, because I think one of the things that, that we find is that some of the conversations around these issues tend to focus up at them without recognizing the huge gap that we have to fill. And, and my greatest concern is that the promise of digital technology will be harnessed not to really tackle the world's greatest problems in the way that it needs to, and not in a fair way that brings in equal benefits across the world to the developing world as well as the developed world. Um, and we really need to close those gaps. And, and it's within communities, but across nations, how do we make sure that there's sufficient investment in digital for the public good? And how do we ensure that the benefits are available to everyone and that the risks aren't disproportionately felt in certain contexts. A good example of that is the fact that um, social media does, as bad as we all may think it does in the English language, it does much worse in a lot of other languages where there are not sufficient content moderators who are able to address and understand the political context and the languages in which things are happening online. So we really need to, to work very hard to make sure that all of the opportunities in the digital world and the threats uh, that need to be managed are done just as well, no matter where you're living globally. All right, so we're going to leave it there for today and for this time. I want to thank the High Commissioner and our panel members, Christian Peggy and Ibrahim, for joining us today and for this discussion. Uh, please do stay in touch. Uh, use the link in the chat to sign up and uh, stay uh, informed about our developments and get involved in the conversation on how we can drive further the impact for human rights using 2.0. And coming up in just a few minutes uh, is a next session on what's next, <laughs> exactly that, on UN 2.0 um, um, on member states. So you might want to jump over quickly to that next meeting. Um, you can go to the main webpage of the UN 2.0 week and you'll find the sign up details there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, take good care. Bye bye.